So let me share with you something that I don't normally talk about, but uh, this so much lines up with, with what I want to share with you. you. You know, I have a friend in one Asian country, I won't mention which, uh, he owns a very large empire which he inherited from his grandfather, and it's a tea empire. Um, and so when we visited him in his country, we stayed at the, at, at the tea plantation, uh, he said, look at all the hills that your eyes can see, all that belongs to me. I thought, wow, okay. I'm very happy for you. <laughs> And so one day after that visit, I happened to receive a phone call and said, Hey, Joe, are you free next week? Would you like to come over to my hillside uh, tea, tea office HQ for the grand opening of my factory? Say, oh, that factory that I, was, I, I visited, okay, it's ready for a grand opening. He said, yeah, yeah. Then what do you want me to do? Come over and play the piano. And he says, I assure you, when you come, I will arrange the logistics and the admin for you, okay? You just have to arrive at the airport. Someone will pick you up and will drive you up to the hill station and, and we will take care of your accommodation and everything else. And I said, and? And then he says, and then, of course, I will invite you here for, to meet the guest of honour, which is the real reason, right? The real reason. And then I thought, and who's the guest of honour? He said, His Royal Highness, Prince Charles. And I uh, said, how? Uh, i got church work to do, no? <laughs> I said, you crazy. Uh. You think I can just drop everything and go and see you and be, be pampered by you and King, uh, Prince Charles, now King? He said, yes. And he was serious. So did I go? Of course not. I've got so much work to do. <laughs> but, but it's true. They had a visit and... And that, that's interesting, right, to, to, to have that kind of invitation. Uh, I don't normally talk about that, but, but what's interesting is I look at Scripture today, we're talking about another king from the book of Haggai. And in the book of Haggai, it's interesting that you talk about King Darius. And then after that, you think, yes, what about King Darius? And you find in Scripture, it just brushes him aside, and here we command, we hear the commands of the one king greater than King Darius himself. And the scripture says, the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts. That's how it all begins. So you think about this. This is the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts. This term appears 90 times throughout the three books, the, the collective books of Haggai, uh, Zechariah, and Malachi. That means it's pretty important. What is the word of the Lord, the Lord Almighty to the prophet Haggai? He mentions of two important persons. First, you have the governor, Zaru Babel, and then the second person is the high priest, very much like my friend who invited me to his hill, hill country station. He said he'll do the administration for me because I have no idea what to do, and he will sort out the administration. But then the real reason for the invitation was for me to meet somebody important, and for the, for the same way, Haggai was invited, uh, had the word that he shared with the governor and the high priest this governor and the high priest, uh, where one is in charge of administration, one's in charge of the spiritual aspect of this message. And so scripture reads to us, uh, for us here in Haggai 1, in the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month. That is basically to give you a calendar so that you know he's not talking rubbish, because this is true. And the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai, to Zerubbabel, the son of she Sheer Tir, governor of Judah, and the second person, and to Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. Why was the word of God given through Haggai to the governor and the high priest? The task was needed for the governor to administrate this next task, and the high priest to bring in a spiritual reminder to the people of Judah. So what was exactly on God's heart? What did he say? So let's delve into this. You will find that God's, God's heart was grieving. His heart was sad. And why is this so? In verse 2, this is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the house, the Lord's house. These people are the people of Judah. Verse 4, 
Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house, which is the house of God, remains a ruin? And then verse 9, God says, My house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. And that was what the house of, that's what God was talking about, his own house. His own house is laying in ruins, but you are managing your own house and beautifying it with panels and wooden, wooden casing and making it comfortable, but my house is in ruins. The house of the Lord, is God interested in building structures of brick and mortar? No. Is God interested in making people so fearful of him so respectful of him, like as if he's a tyrant? No. If you remember last week, we were reminded that when God gives us a task, he is the Lord Creator King. When he gives us a task, he builds and he provides. When God gives a task, he builds and he'll provide. And then after that, he'll invite us to partner with him. So you remember in creation, the animals were, and creation was taken care of. God provides. And then he part, asked Adam, will you partner with me? I, will, I want you to take care of the earth, the Edenic covenant. When Noah was asked to build the ark, God provided the wood. God even brought the animals to Noah. Why? When God asked Noah to partner with him to save the remnant of people. And so this theme keeps carrying on. When God gives a task, He provides. When He provides, then He will invite you, will you join me or will you not? So here's the next question, right? Why does God accuse Judah, the people of Judah, of, of no, why would God not accuse? Why, why would God want the people of Judah to partner with Him in this book of Haggai? Why would God invite the people of Jerusalem to build God's own house? if he's not interested in brick and mortar? The reason is simple. It's because of God's own glory. You see, in the following chapter, you find that here God says, I will shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. Shake what? The riches of all them. I will shake all nations and what, and, and what is desired by all nations. They will come and I will fill this house with glory says the Lord Almighty. And he goes on further to say, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, everything you have there is mine, declares the Lord. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace. Here, the fullness of God's glory is seen in the most important of his creation, God says, mankind, will you partner with me? Rebuild my house. I will shake the heavens. All the riches of the nations will come. And I will fill this house. And my glory will fill the earth. Which is what you are here for. I invited you so that my glory will be seen. That redeemed can be, and those who are made holy are because of my glory. This is God's glory uncontested, un incomparable to anyone or to anything. If you read further, the glory of this present house really is not only about the house in Jerusalem. As you think about that, those of us who know the Lord Jesus, the glory of this house was the one who tore it down and in three days later rose again. And he dwells with us. We are the living stones. And that's really worthy for another sermon. But can you see what God says? Come and rebuild my house and that my glory will be seen in the nations. So if God really wants to bless Judah, say, come partner with me, then why did Judah say, no lah, not interested? Why did Judah allow obstacles to become excuses to build the house of the Lord there in Jerusalem? Here we have obstacles to not build the house of the Lord. Why did Judah not want to build the house of the Lord? I can think of four excuses that they might give themselves. Number one, I God, cannot build your house. Lah. The timing is not right. 
Timing is not right. You know, I must build my own house first. You know, you must have nice things, comfortable living. Then when I'm comfortable, then I have time for your house. Another excuse is, uh, God, I don't want to build your house because you know what? I don't have the money. Have you looked around the, 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 the heavens? You have, withdrew, you have actually uh, stopped the land from producing at all. I, I have the land's in trouble. There's droughts in the fields. There's drought in the mountains. Fruit production is down. There's no grain. That means I can't make any bread. I can't make any noodles. Not that they ate noodles in those times. No grain. Then after that, I got no wine. What am I to drink? River water? Ugh. But then the food, the food production is down. Olive trees are not producing any fruit. So how do I blend my flour if I have flour? And vegetation, livestock not producing even. No mutton chops. How? God, financially, I'm just not stable. Not ready to build your house. Sorry. Another one is, God, I cannot build your house. Lah. It's a matter of commitment. You know, you know what? It's actually not my problem. It's not my business to build the house of the Lord. Why? Because somewhere there's a, a prophet somewhere that said, the one who will rebuild the house would be the Messiah. Hello, my name is not Messiah. So, not me lah. Let the Messiah build the house. Fourth obstacle. God, I, I want to build your house, you know. I really do, but then, uh, scared lah. I'm terrified. I mean, don't you remember the, the, the big king from that faraway land? He came and he tore down your house. So who am I to contest this big king, right? And to rebuild what he tore down. After all, I got a lot of nagging people outside there. Then there's Sambalat and Tobiah, their names. You remember the name Sambalat, Tobiah? It just rattles off your mouth. They cause so much complaints. I mean, I'm very scared. Like, no need to build your house, can? So these obstacles suddenly became excuses to not build the God's house and his temple, to not co-work with God and his mission. Judah then broke their part of the promise, and with a broken covenant, they brought upon themselves covenant-breaking curses. God was displeased. The people remained disobedient. And what do you have? Covenant-breaking curses. God's glory to Judah and Israel and to all the nations of the world. Can you imagine? God says, I'm waiting for my glory to shine forth, but your disobedience is hindering it. And so let's go through the list of curses. Not very nice, huh? On Sunday morning, we talk about curses. But if I may tell you how the curses actually begin from small, the individual, to the family, and from the family to the nation. So hang on to your horses. Let's go. To the individual, you have planted much. Plant, 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 plant. And you harvest? So little. To the individual, you eat and eat, but you're never full. You drink and drink, but your thirst is never quenched. You put on clothes, and you never feel warm. Now, you have to reverse that. Huh? We want air conditioning here, right? But you know what I mean. You put on clothes to feel warm, but then you still feel very cold. You earn wages, and you put them in purses with holes. Boop, drops. You put it in the purse, boop, it disappears. Where does it go? You expect so much, and then you see so little. To the individual, that is one curse. It goes on. And then you bring home your stuff to your home. You bring it home, and what does God say? I blew it away. <sighs> Why do I blow it away? Because my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you busy with your own house. It gets worse for the nations and for the environment. The heavens will withdraw their dew. The earth will not produce crops. There will be drought in the fields, drought in the mountains. No grain, no wine, no olive oil. Nothing on the ground will be produced. Even your livestock, you will not have any gain and profit with that. These are misplaced priorities where people choose to neglect 
than God. Because myself is important when God says, no, it's about my glory. Because you know what? Hey, there isn't any other person that will share that glory with me because no one can. It's my glory and I'm inviting you to work with me. And you say, no? You know, today's message is not a nod. It's not a... Uh, 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 a validation of what you call the dangerous prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel teaches you, hey, put $100 into the offering bag, God will give you back $400. Claim it, man, claim it. That kind of talk will never happen here in this church by the grace of God. You know why? Because that kind of gospel tells you, God, bless me. Bless me, the here and now. But God says, partner with me, look to me, my people. But then after that, I want you, as I bless you, to look to others. Take care of things that are of eternal value. Not your present bank account only. Not that. It's for other people. God will care for the here and now. You know why? Because He has really cared for eternity. What is the here and now? If God can care for eternity, the here and now is nothing to him. And so here we go to the promises of God. If Judah has brought this upon themselves, the curses of God, because of their disobedience, can we reverse it? Can we see a reversal? If Judah would only, only obey God. This is what the Lord Almighty says, verse 7, give careful thought to your way. We need you to consider We need you to calculate and think this through carefully. God says, go up to the mountain and bring down timber. Eh? I thought you said the mountain had drought. Could God possibly have some parts of the mountain in drought and some parts unknown, lush with big fat trees? And God say, go there. Because What's a mountain? God is bigger than the mountain. Half dry, half lush, lush can or so what? Go up to the mountain, bring down timber, and then build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honoured, says the Lord. Give careful ways to your thoughts. Reconsider your life choices, O people, because I will fully provide The trees have been growing there for years. They are ready for you to use for my house. And perhaps there will be a reversal of curses. The harvests will be full. For myself, I planted much, and I'm going to have much that I can harvest. It will be full. I eat, and I am grateful. I drink, and I will be filled. My clothes will satisfy. I earned wages put in my purse, and then I realized, hey, I couldn't have done this myself. God has done this. It is I who provide. Whatever I bring home to my family, God says, I will multiply. Watch me. To the country and to the nation, to the environment, God will open up heavens. He says, I will open up the heavens and they will give forth their dew, the earth and its crops. I call for it to flourish in the fields and the mountains. All that you need to eat, your livestock, your your reward is there, the labor of your hands. And then what will happen? God's glory will be seen not because we have much, but we are reminded that the one who provides much is God himself. And his glory goes out from here to the nations outside Jerusalem. Then we go on to verse 12. Zerubbabel, the son of Shetel, Joshua, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people, what did they do? They obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And what, what happened to the people? They feared the Lord. The people of Judah turned away from their excuses. They turned from fear. They turned from their sloth they turn from inactivity and they say, okay, let's obey the voice of the Lord. Let's heed the message that Haggai has given to us to both our administrator and our high priest. Together, let's do this so that it will go to the nations 
And then as they feared the Lord, verse 13, here you, you read that Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave the message. And verse 14, the Lord stirred up the spirit of the people. But not only that, if you read into the verses 14, God stirred up the spirit of, the Jeruz- uh, of Zerubbabel, and God stirred up the spirit of Joshua. The two, the administrator, the high priest, God stirred up their spirit. The third group of people, God stirred up the people. And what happened? They came and began to work on the house of the Lord, the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. It is God who provides. It is God who says, hey, I'm with you. I give you a task. I don't drop you into the ocean and let you sink or swim. I will uphold you. I will stir up the spirits of these three, Zerubbabel, of Joshua, of the people. And the people can begin your work. Now, it's my pleasure to invite on stage with me, Pastor Solomon. The Lord has moved in his spirit and stirred his spirit such that he has been here serving so faithfully. Pastor Solomon uh, looks younger than me because he's got more hair. (laughs) <laughs> but Pastor Solomon is our pastor for the Nepali congregation. Can you please welcome him? Over to you, Pastor Solomon. Please share. I am 67. <laughs> Retired already. I thank God for giving me this opportunity to share about what is happening in our Nepali ministry. Wow. Good morning, Bartley family. Uh, a bit louder. Good morning, Bartley family. Morning. Yes. Okay, I bring greetings from our Nepali congregation to this whole church, to Pastor Joe and whole team. Let me go through this one. If not, I will hop, stop, and hop, step, and jump. So I have to follow this one. <clears throat> My name is Solomon Adhikari. I'm a lay pastor for this Nepali ministry here. I have been leading this Nepali congregation for 14, uh, 14 years now. Last, month, last week only we celebrated our 14th anniversary. So now, okay, now we are in the 15th year. I remember Pastor William, Pastor Alwyn, those, these leaders, they really gave us opportunity to use the room and we are here all this while. When we started 14 years back, I found out that we were uh, 19 adults and six children. That's why we started. At the moment, we are 133. <laughs> Out of 133, 130 are ladies. Only three are male. <laughs> pastor Celesty, you were here as a lady pastor. Okay, we are only three. Recently, one brother came for uh, Bible college, so we are now 133, uh, but three male only. My wife is here. Sarah, can you stand up? Let people see. They've seen me, but not mine. My wife. My wife is here, and my name is Solomon, King Solomon. Only one wife, <laughs> up to this point. Okay. <clears throat> okay, um, okay, we are growing. God really gave us opportunity to grow. We are growing. And I'm involved in uh, Malaysia also. Before joining uh, Bakri Church, I was involved in Malaysia also. And God allowed me, God used me to plant three churches in Malaysia, in Johor State only. Now they are growing. And from one of the church, uh, what I know is about six, seven are becoming a pastors in Nepal also. So God really bless us. I think many of you know also a place called Batu Pahat in uh, Malaysia, Johor. Uh, I am involved there for 21 years already. So God really has extended his uh, kingdom uh, using me. I will add, I will, uh, uh, I will tell you why I'm using God use me. This word uh, I'll end at the end. Our congregation here is only domestic helpers. 
almost all are domestic helpers, so we do not have a Bible studies, no house fellowship, no prayer meetings, only we go through the uh, WhatsApp only. Otherwise, only Sunday service we, we meet here all this while. <clears throat> um, I came to Singapore because I married to a Singaporean. <laughs> so she pulled me here, so I am here. I did not know why God brought me here. Initially, actually, I was thinking that uh, I'll buy a, I had a, I was working in one of the mission hospital in India, and uh, I am a Nepalese born, born and brought up in India, so I was, I came here to earn money to boost my uh, travel agency, but I did not know how God had planned. That's why I, God gave me my rib here, so I came here. I did not know why I was here, but at the end only, I came to know uh, why God brought me here. <clears throat> okay. There was a pastor called Freddy Ho. Uh, I don't know, many, some of you may know, Pastor Freddy Ho. One day he told me, there is some Nepalese coming to, in Malaysia, one of the English church. They do not understand Nepali. Can you go to translate? I said, okay, without thinking anything, where is Batu Pahad, what? I didn't know anything. I just said, okay. Just because I said, okay, God planted a church there. Now it's almost 100 people keep on coming and going, factory workers, but really God raised six, seven pastors from that church back in Nepal at the moment. <laughs> Praise God. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, I'm finishing now. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and here in uh, Singapore also, uh, I used to go with a team in Teka Market to go and share the word of God. Then from there also, uh, people came to uh, our, our service and accepted Christ. Now also we have got uh, four teams to go and share there in Tekka Market to Nepalese, inviting them to come to church. And from there also, people have accepted Christ. Last, last week we, had a, uh, we, we celebrate our 14th anniversary. What happened is, there is a lady, next door lady, she's a non-Christian, she's not a believer. She told me, I will bring a cake for your anniversary, then I said, no need, no need, no need, we will buy our, said, no, 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 I bring, I bring. Your next door neighbor, non-Christian uh, 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 a guest, bought the cake for us. Uh, in uh, last week, uh, our anniversary. So there is an opportunity for this Bartley church. Why God put here is your next door neighbor had got hundreds of uh, thousands of Nepalese there. Who will reach out to them? Because of the language barrier, you cannot go. And you are not allowed to go also. But we are a bridge. Yes. We play as a bridge. There are people, non-Christian people are bringing cake for our anniversary. When I say no also, but they are willing there. No. Who will go? Who will go? You cannot go. You are not allowed to enter your neighbor's compound. But we are the bridge to reach out to them. Yep. This church is here for so long, and our next door neighbors are not saved. Hmm. So we have a system to reach out to them. So we need to work as a partner. Barclay Church has given us a place, the timing, everything is blessed. Uh, this church has blessed us many ways, but we are still not able to reach out to our neighbors. And there are many in uh, Tekka market also. So next month onwards, we are having a, a computer class it's a computer class, English and basic English and computer class, but this one is not to give them a certificate or, or diploma, but just to have a basic uh, uh, operation of laptops. And we are looking for the helpers. We are looking for the helpers <laughs> from this corner to that corner, from front line to the back bench. We are looking for the helpers 
just to teach them how to on the computer, how to hold the mouse, which I am also not very familiar. I have to ask many things, my son and my wife, how to work this one, even the phone also. But we are looking, we are looking, hope you all will respond to us. Uh, oh, oh, it's here, so easy nowadays. <laughs> Please help us to reach out to your neighbors because I live in Swasugang, I'm far away. But your neighbors are here, and they, are, they haven't heard the good news of uh, salvation. So please respond and help us. You only need to do is maybe once or twice a month only for four months, starting from next, uh, month, next month, first uh, August, first week of August. Please join us to reach out to non-believing uh, our neighbors, and let us jointly extend the God's kingdom. Amen? Amen. Amen. Please help us. Please help us. And one more. The last one is, <clears throat> uh, I think maybe Brother Sean, Brother Chu, they know that we had a, 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 a musical concert before COVID-19, and there were 12 people accepted Christ here in this stage, Nepalese. Just because of the music only, 12 people accepted. Now in December, also we are having a, another a singing, what, what to use the word? Concert. Huh? Concert. Okay, singing Sorry, concert. I need you to stand here for the camera. Oh, oh, oh okay. You. Yes, yes. Now talk about the concert. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so we, we are having a concert here, and in this concert, this singer used to be a very famous a uh, secular singer. She became a Christian and now singing, she's singing uh, Christian songs. So non-Christians and Christians are known to this, uh, they know this uh, singer and she's willing to come in December on 22nd. We are needing your help for the security need, uh, purpose also because there will be a, we are expecting about six, seven hundred to thousand uh, Nepalese coming to this church to attend uh, this uh, uh, program. We need a, a, a security people, not a muscular one. Muscular one is better, but not. Even big stomach also can. Uh, we will be having a lot of people down there. We need to have a, some kind of a control. Even here also, sitting position also. So please, Help us to, to have these two programs. One is a computer one, and another one is a December 22nd. We are expecting this hall will be full of Nepalese. More than 100 will be non-Christians. Hope everybody will help us in this case. And thank you very thank much. You. Before you go, my team said we cannot let you go without praying for you, and also I think I'll pray for Sarah. So join, join your, your hands with me in prayer. Yeah? Our gracious Father, we thank you for the work that you have brought uh, Pastor Solomon through, and thank you for his faithfulness to take care of our congregation here in Bartley. Father, may your, the light of Christ be seen through him and Sarah, that as they serve you, uh, the joy of the Lord will be... Uh, will be impacting the, the sisters who come here and the brothers too. And for his work in, in Johor, among the seven congregations that he gives consultant uh, work and, and pastoral advice, and even to Batu Pahat. Father, the, when, when we go into to JB, we, we meet Nepali after Nepali. Lord, every Nepali we meet, may they come into contact with the gospel because of people who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and because they have been impacted by the work that Pastor Solomon and his team are doing. Will you just go ahead of this, brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters, with regard to the computer and, and the concert that we have here. Lord, will you give us wisdom that as one church we work together to see uh, the light of Christ uh, being sung, the light of Christ being shown uh, in how we, we, we love and respect one another uh, through classes and how we take care of each other. We give you thanks for their work. Give them increase, O Lord, Pastor Solomon and, and, and Sarah. Bless them with good health and, and support them with Lord, more and more people who will put their hands to the plow. We give you thanks. You are the Lord of the harvest. We give you thanks in Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Solomon. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
And now to carry on with the sermon. <laughs> Just, uh, that's so exciting. I don't know about you, but, but this is what the work of our, our Lord is doing, right? We are missions go. And that can only happen if there is love surround. But love surround is quite baseless. It's just emotional if we don't have foundations. And that's where foundations deep come in. How does all this relate to missions? It's precisely what Bartley is obeying God for. We want to build deep foundations in the word of the Lord, in, in loving Him, becoming more like Christ. In, in, in loving one another, that's where love surrounds. But we go out in missions. I want to ask you to, to consider now as I, as I move towards the closing here that, that I ask this question, what do you think is in your hands? When God asked the people of Judah in Jerusalem, why are you building your own houses when my house is in ruins? Then naturally we will ask, what is in your hands? Are there materials to build your own house or are there materials to build the temple of God? Later on, when you re read the story of, of how the exiles came back from Babylon, you find that in the book of Nehemiah, the builders were each taken, one family take one side of the wall, but in their hands, one hand was a building equipment, but the other hand was a weapon of defense because they had trouble. Those hands were busy and engaged in the work of the Lord. So I want you to ask yourself, what is in your hands? What are you holding back from giving back to God, which I remind us all, everything you have in your hands never came from you. Everything you have in your hands comes from God. What are you holding back? Are you holding back your time and your talent? Then give your time and talent, make room for it. It may not happen next week, but if you don't do anything about it, six months will go very quickly and you'll forget that God is prompting your heart to come and build his house. May you never be found to be accused of only building your own house and neglecting the house of the Lord. How about your finances and security? And this is where we encourage, we are encouraged by the number of givings that, that, that has come from our church and, and, and how this not only comes from a sector of people, it comes across the board. Brothers and sisters, giving is one way of how we see God shaking the heavens and the earth. What is in your hand? Is it your comfort and your ease? Is that more important to you? Then will you be in a place of discomfort, but a place of satisfaction because you have served the Lord? And whatever you do in your hands will last eternity. I'm thinking about our loved ones. Parents, will you allow your children to go and serve the Lord? Children, will you allow your aging parents to serve the Lord in the remaining years of their life? Don't stop them. Let them go. Let them serve the Lord. We can be indifferent. We can also say, ah, I don't want to be bothered. Lah. Why be bothered about this? You know, we can do that. But beware. Beware with that. Because that is in total, complete disobedience when the Lord clearly says, I am already at work. I have given you the resources. Will you come and join me? I need to speak to one group of people is that some of us here are growing in our churches here. I'm not targeting anyone. I don't have anyone in mind, but I'm thinking about clusters of people here. There's some of us here in Bartley, you've been parked here in Bartley for a long time. Some have come here for the last two years. Some have been with us for 10 years. And it's not just here but some of us come on our Wednesday meetings, Thursday meetings, and we, 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 we join all the activities here. But you know one thing that's very, very worrisome is that there's so many of us parked here, but we don't move our church membership here. What does that mean? I will not grow my roots here because my membership is with another church. But hey, your body is here, right? Your membership should also follow, right? And if you are moving to another church, I say, take your membership with you, with our blessing, so that you can bless that church over there, your finances, your routing, your friendships, your investment. So many of us are coming through here for the last few years, but we are not doing anything to say, this is God's place for me. This is where I'll plant my roots. Can I ask you, what is in your hand? Is it time for you to say, this is where... I will be a contributor to the house of God. 
I will not just be a consumer. I will be a contributor, not a consumer. And then when you, when you look at your hands, the other question I want to ask you is, do you say to yourself, I'm not skilled enough, I'm too old to serve? No. Because you know what? Whatever's in your hands, our God has given that to you. He will use it to raise up. Can we hear the next video, please? After my A-level, I worked as a substitute teacher to earn some money for university. One day on a trip with some high schoolers, I looked back at them. I thought, here they were, they had just had a very good trip. Why are they not happy? Then I heard a still small voice. That is your mission field. From that day onwards, teaching no longer became just a job, but a vocation. In 1988, the Lord sent me for my first assignment in Nepal to teach third culture kids at Kamandu International Study Center or KISC. The Lord has opened many other doors to teach TCKs in other countries. I also homeschooled some refugees from Myanmar. The daily contact of working with students opened up opportunities for me to bring out the best in them, challenge them to be a witness for the Lord. Over our years on the field, we have met many, many global workers who have obeyed God's call to use their skills and be a witness wherever God placed them. We have met many fellow workers who use their handyman skills to uh, repair air cons, generators, and even build studios. Currently, there's a ministry in Thailand who is looking for handyman to assemble wheelchairs so that they can bring it to remote poor villages to give to those who cannot afford to buy one. A couple in Thailand bought coffee beans. They then trained the farmers to grow coffee trees, harvest the beans, roast them, and sell them. And this became an income generation project. And over time, a very strong friendship developed, and the local people saw the love of this couple and saw Jesus in them. You may wonder how a deaf person can actually serve cross-culturally. We met a um, deaf brother from Europe who came to Bangkok and worked with the Thai deaf Christians there to translate the Bible into Thai sign language to bless the deaf community in Thailand. That provided the deaf community an opportunity to understand the Bible better. A Singaporean couple in their 40s who are both architects used their skill to build homes for refugees and victims of earthquake and war. And so the local people saw the love of this couple. An ethnomusicologist worked with Christian tribal villages to use local art forms such as songs, dance, drama, for worship and Bible learning. Skilled IT personnel are in high demand. They provide IT support for field staff as well as write programs to create tools for Bible translation. They also train refugees to gain computer skills so that these refugees can get remote jobs to earn a living. So why am I telling you all this? To enter and stay in a country, however short or long, you need a visa. Gone are the days of the traditional mission model where workers can enter a country as a missionary. Today, most governments will grant a long-term visa to a worker if he has a skill that can benefit the local people. God can use any skill. God is not so much concerned what you and I can do, but rather what He wants to do in us and through us, so that we can be fit for the Master's use, so that we can go to the regions beyond and bring the Gospel to where His name has yet to be proclaimed. Will you rise with me? And sound from the piano, you please. Thank you. Will you come and follow me? If I but call your name Will you go where you don't know And never be the same Will you let my love be shown Will you let my name be known Will you let my life be grown in you And you in me 
what is in your hands, my brothers and sisters. God can use anything. When God says, build my house, let's come with whatever's in our hands and say, God, this is what my prayer is. As God asks us, will you let the blinded see if I but call your name will you set the prisoner free and never be the same will you kiss the leper clean and do such as this unseen and admit to what I mean in you and you in me May this be our prayer. Lord, your summons echoes true when you but call my name. Yes, Lord, let me turn and follow you and never be the same. Will you accompany? I'll go where your love and footsteps show. Then I'll move and live and grow in you and you in me.